Jesus at the center of it all. Good morning to everybody. Just before I start to minister, I want to just um, thank Pastor Peter for inviting me to this camp. You know, it's, uh, uh, sometimes it's just very brave men that invite me to preach at their meetings, you know, uh, <laughs> because uh, I carry a, a, a radical message. So thank you so much. Uh, the way you've treated me here is exceptional. I've never eaten so much, not even in America, you know, I even decided not to eat this morning, you know, because I know, you know, when I go home, <laughs> you know, to Pastor Peter's house, you know, I'll suffer for Jesus, you know, <laughs> uh, everybody has just been so friendly, this church, and um, what is happening here is phenomenal, uh, just the, the, the growth that I see here even just the, uh, the spiritual maturity um, that I see in the people when I meet them is extraordinary, uh, and it really blessed me. You know, I'm, <clears throat> I think my wife, you know, she, she didn't want to come with <clears throat> on this trip because of my children and everything, and I know there's a time for, for staying at home, and there's a time for traveling and those kind of things, and she just said, man, I'm going to stick with, my, with the kids, and I'm going to be here for them, and I honor her for that. But I think after I sent all the pictures and everything, you know, that's happening here, um, she was a bit saddened, you know. <laughs> you know so, uh, yeah, thank you so much for everything. You guys have just been so good to me. I really feel loved by you. I'm going to talk a little bit um, on faith just uh, for short, and then I want to talk about no condemnation. And what no, condem what no condemnation actually means in the Bible. No condemnation does not mean not to feel guilty. We have confused the word guilt with the word condemn. And I think what is happening in grace churches, in grace circles, because of this confusion, um, you know, or where we've made the word grace and the word condemn, oh, sorry, the word uh, 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 condemnation and the word guilt, the same word, giving it the same meaning, I think the message of grace can lose a little bit of its power um, in bringing forth good fruit in the lives of people. Now, yesterday I talked about faith uh, um, and, and, and the importance of faith. I want to say this, it is impossible to be saved without faith. Uh, God is pleased when we have faith. Amen. Uh, but what is this faith? Faith is a persuasion um, in your mind on account of what Christ has done. Is when you are persuaded that He has died for you, and when He died, He died your death for you. That the old man passed away in Christ. What is this old man that died in Jesus? The old man that died in Jesus is the man that tried to be justified by his works. That man died. When Christ was born, he was born of a woman under the law. What does that mean? That means that he represents or that he was um, given on the platform of law. He represents man under the law the law. And when Jesus died, he was the representative of the human race. And when he died, then the man that could be justified by the law died. I want to explain it this way, and we're talking about faith here, the persuasion of our heart. When Adam sinned, he sinned on behalf of mankind. When Adam disobeyed, he was the representative of mankind, and all of man was affected by what Adam did. The sin Adam committed was to say that as from today, mankind will find his life or will find eternal life by the works he commit, by what he does and by what he possess. That is what Adam did, and all of mankind was dumped into the system that says, you are 
what you do. You are what you possess. Uh, the glory in your life that comes from the things you possess and the things you do will define you. And from that definition, you will believe in that definition and then you will have life by the good you do. That is what Adam did. Let me say that again. Adam decided on behalf of all of mankind, for he was a representative of mankind, that all of mankind shall have life by his works. That's what Adam did. Jesus Christ came and incarnated himself into man, basically into Adam, and died Adam away. So when Jesus died, Adam and his contract he cut with himself that he would have life by what he does ended forever. And, the, uh, and when Jesus was raised, he was raised as a human and he was seated in the Trinity. <clears throat> he was seated at the right hand of the Father. And now the way Jesus lives in heaven is made available for us. We were to have life by our works, but now we live the way Jesus lives, and Jesus lives in the persuasion of his heart, meaning he lives by faith. So now, the only way we can have life is to live by faith. That's the only way we can have life. There is no other way we can have life. Faith is a persuasion. The Bible says that we are um, that, we, that the faith of Jesus Christ makes us righteous. What does that mean? That doesn't mean Jesus believes on our behalf. That's not what it means. It means that the persuasion that was made available through what Jesus Christ has done will bring salvation to us. So when we believe what Jesus believes, when we believe what or when we are persuaded of what, uh, um, what he did and what it implies, it brings salvation to us. You know, I've asked, uh, there are many people that believe that Jesus died. The Muslim people believe that Jesus died. You know, uh, they believe that he was raised. They believe that he will even return. The Jews in Jesus' time, they believe that Jesus was the Son of God. Because when he died and there was an earthquake, they said, surely he is the Son of God. But those very same people that believed he was the Son of God, that believed he died, for they put a, they, they, a, a spear was put in his side, and they saw him die. They saw his death. They believed that he died. They even believed that he rose again. They were persuaded that he rose again, for after his resurrection, they said, Tell everybody his disciples stole him. They had faith even with works. You know? They believed so much in his resurrection that they actually fabricated a lie about the resurrection. Now, the fact that they believe or that they uh, were persuaded that he died, that he uh, was the son of God and that he rose again, did not save them. Because... There, that kind of a faith can never save you. They believe he died historically. They believe he rose again historically. And they believed, you know, that he was the Son of God historically. There are many people today that believe in that. We can even prove that historically by uh, historic scriptures. But just believing that is not what saves you. What true faith is, is to be persuaded of what his death implies of what his resurrection implies and what his obedience implies. His death implies that the lawman has died. When we are persuaded of that, it brings forth salvation. What his, what his obedience implied is that he obeyed on my behalf. What his resurrection implies is that the life that he possesses at the right hand of the Father is now freely available to me, not by my own works, but by the Spirit that raised Christ from the dead. So what that means is that the Holy Spirit will raise up in me uh, kindness. The Holy Spirit will raise up in me love. 
the Holy Spirit will raise up in me joy. The Holy Spirit will raise up in me long-suffering, contentment, and all those kind of things. And eventually, the Holy Spirit will even make my human body immortal. Amen. That's the implication. That's what I call faith. We are persuaded of what Jesus Christ has done and what it implies. That is faith. Belief to me, and these two words are very close in the Greek as well. Belief is once I have seen these facts and I've come to be fully persuaded that it is the truth that my mind now goes to rest and I'm not in struggles anymore trying to produce holiness, but my mind is at rest that God will bring it forth in me. And I make my body available now for Him to bear His fruit in me. Hallelujah. I want to see uh, kindness. I want to see temperance. I want to see faithfulness. I want to see those things come forth in my life on account of a love relationship with God. And uh, Pastor Peter just take it, you know, uh, uh, just took the whole uh, camp together so beautifully. It is all about a loving God that wants to share His life with you. That is what Dynamic Love Ministries, my ministry is all about. I just want to share the dynamics of God's love so that we can share in His quality of life. The gospel of Jesus. So let, let me first elaborate a little bit more on belief. So belief is when your mind goes to rest at the integrity of somebody else. Let me say that again, and you can jot that down if you want. Belief is when your mind goes to rest at the integrity of someone else. I can explain it this way. Maybe you want to buy a car. Now you go to the salesperson that's going to sell you a car. Let's say this is a used car. So if it's a used car, you know, you must be careful because, you know, there can be some mistakes in the car or there can be some faults and it can cost you dearly later on. Thank God, just by the way, in South, I don't know here, but in South Africa they've got this new law. If, you've, if somebody sold you something, you can, you, you can give it back in two weeks and they must give you your money back or they must repair it for the next six months. Government law. So you've got a little bit more of grace now buying a, a used car. But even then, you still have your concerns buying this used car. And you would talk to the, um, to the salesperson. And then the salesperson would come and tell you certain things about this car. Say you want to buy a Toyota. They will tell you, you know, a Toyota or let's say a Honda. A Honda is known as the most reliable vehicle in the world. It's won the competition so many times, you know. And then you get that information, you know, and then you feel a little bit less stressed about buying this car. And he would show you, you know, maybe on his phone, the latest reward Honda got for the safest, or I mean for the most uh, durable car in the world, you know, that doesn't break. And then when you see that, you, you are persuaded in your heart that that is the truth. And then he comes and he tells you, you see, this car has only got 20,000 kilometers, uh, you know, on the clock. And he takes out the service history of the car and proves to you that it was served by, uh, serviced by Honda. And as you see that these documents are authentic and that it is so, you even find that uh, you get persuaded that this is the truth. But still, you don't feel to buy the car. And then he comes and he explains to you, you know, that look at the space the car has. And he tells you about the safety features. And then he tells you about the wonderful fuel consumption this car has. And then he comes with another fact. You know, this is a hybrid. So you don't have to pay so much tax on this vehicle. And as you get persuaded of all these things... Being persuaded of these facts is, I have got faith that this is true. And as all these things come together, you find something click in your mind, and your mind goes to rest and say, I can now trust this car. I can rest in the quality and the authenticity and the 
the, the care that this, car was, that this car was taken good care of, and that is called belief. Your mind goes to rest on account of your heart being persuaded by all the facts that this is good. That is belief. So when we believe in Him is when, we, when our minds go to rest at the fact that Jesus was enough. That song we sing all the time, He is enough for me. That's the declaration of your belief. If I ask you, why is He enough for you? Then you will give me your persuasion or the faith that you have, which is towards what is done for you on the cross. The reason I preached that yesterday is so that we can never abuse our faith towards just earthly things, but that we can have a heart persuaded that we do have great faith. Many times we disqualify ourselves thinking, do I have enough faith? Do I have great enough faith? If you believe that Jesus took away your sins, you've got great faith. If you believe that he obeyed on your behalf, you've got great faith. If you believe that he fulfilled the law for you, you've, you don't have some faith. You've got what Jesus declares as great faith. We, have, we thought that great faith is to concentrate hard. And then we would see other people that can concentrate harder than us. Other people that are more devoted than us. And we would say... You know, look how great their faith is. Where Jesus defined great faith as a persuasion that his word is greater than the law. Where Jesus defines great faith as him, as a person that believes that he removed all the disqualification and qualified you. So if you are seated here this morning and you are a believer in the grace of God, your mind goes to rest at the grace of God and you are persuaded that he obeyed for you, he died the law man away and he represents you in his perfect holiness at the right hand of the Father, I want to declare to you, you've got great faith this morning. Amen. There's nothing wrong with your faith. Nothing can be added to it. You have arrived. You know the gospel is only so big. You know, the, you know there's not a new revelation every day. The gospel is the simple message that Adam, this is the gospel, Adam dumped us into works righteousness and through that we were condemned unto death. Jesus Christ came and dumped us into, we shall live by the persuasion of our heart, and so shall we have life. And this he did by ending the law, obeying on our behalf, and being resurrected on our behalf. And those who are persuaded of this shall have his life. That is the fullness of the gospel. There's nothing more, nothing more to add to that, and we cannot take anything away from that. If that is what you believe, Listen, my friend, that is it. I want to just say something from a pastoral perspective. We should never put pressure on our leaders to always come with a new revelation. That is a very dangerous thing to do. Because if the preacher falls for that, you know what's going to happen? He's going to start to suck some preaching out of his thumb. And you're going to suffer under those false teachings because you always feel pressured, I must preach something new. I must have some fresh manna from heaven. Listen, there's just one manna. It's Jesus. And if your pastor preaches the cross and preaches the finished work and that you are righteous, free from your works, and that he gives you life for free, and that Jesus sets you free from death for free, Hallelujah! And let him preach it every Sunday until Jesus comes. Amen. I want to touch on something and I'm going to explain condemnation. Where, there's a natural cycle that I see in a lot of people's lives that get into the message of grace. This is the cycle. They get saved, someday they receive Jesus, 
then they get into a Lord church. And when they're in the Lord church, they're very, excuse me, passionate for the gospel. They would give their money. They would give their life. They would work. They would give everything. And then they get under the law. And as they get under the law, they work harder and give more and do more. And even harder because they are passionate for God. And in their passion, they'll do anything for God. And then after some years, they become tired and realize that the law is condemn, condemning them to death. And that they cannot have life by their own works. Then one of the two things happen. They just feel very guilty and continue to try harder. Or they leave the church. That's what happens. They first find fault and then just leave. And then somehow they get hold of a grace message. They come to a grace church and now they are very happy that they are in grace. You know? And they look back. And, and the reason I can preach it so well is because this was me, you know. And you look back at the old system, and you're very angry. You're angry at the old system. You're angry at how you were abused. You are angry at how you unnecessarily served to get an anointing when the anointing was always for free. You're angry at the thousands of dollars you gave to get God to bless you when the blessing was actually for free. You are angry at going to church twice on a Sunday and the midweek service where you could only have heard from God yourself. Now you're very angry. Now you come to the Grace Church and you take out your anger on the Grace Church. You know, in the Grace Church, now listen to this. You know, we can't, we can't say, come to the service. Then you say, Pastor, don't force me out. Eh? <laughs> Even as preachers in church, we are scared to speak about money and grace because, you know, of the hurt and the abuse that comes from the old law. Isn't it? <laughs> it's the way it is. I remember one time in my own church, Oh, I hope they don't hear this. We need to edit this out. In my own church, we moved from one building to the other building. And we had a good income in the one building, you know. So we went to a bigger building. Just a, it's, it's not big. It's just 100 seats. So we went from like 50 seats to 100 seats. And then we, but the price is more. But the money we normally received on a month was more than enough so we could cover the cost for this new place. So, the first month, you know, with me, I don't look at the bank. I just preach, you know. And then I, my wife, she does all the payments and stuff. And, and my secretary all, does the books and all those kind of things. So, after about three months, I said to my uh, secretary, Man, you know, how's the giving? She said, you know, for this month, we only received for the whole month $70. I said, come on, man, you can't count, man. Impossible. And you know what? It was really $70, and for three months, a Dynamic Love Ministries, which is a web-based ministry, was carrying the church, basically all the giving. I didn't even know. So there's something wrong. And I prayed, and I realized what was happening here is the people were so hurt concerning building churches and paying for churches that when we went to the new building that hurt manifested into I can't give for this church and this is the revelation I received you know if you go and look at um, and this is the revelation rebellion against the law does not equal grace that is not grace it's just a rebellion it's just a rebellion. In South Africa, you know, we had the old South Africa, 
um, where people were oppressed, and they rebelled against the new system, uh, against uh, the, the, the apartheid system. Now the apartheid system is over. 20 years already, and we're finding they are still rebelling against apartheid that's always over, now looking like fools. They're rebelling against something that's not there. In the very same way, what's happening is the apartheid, you know, gave birth to their rebellion. And now the apartheid is still the father of their life. Under the law, we got hurt. And now we come to grace, but we continue with the hurt of the law, meaning the life I live now, the rebellious life where I rebel against the law, the law is still the father of that life, and it will kill you. The Bible even says their rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft in 1 Samuel 15. Let me explain that to you. I always thought, and I was taught that, that in church that says, you know, you should never rebel against the leader even if he's wrong. Now, that is a lie. If the leader does not preach the truth, you don't have to obey that. You know, you don't have to be abused. You don't have to go through hurt. It's not needed. Okay? And if you were in a church where, or if you are in a church where, where there's law and all those kind of things, you don't have to first fight with the pastor before you leave. Just, you know... Buy him lunch, be good to him. The guy preached to you from the sincerity of his heart in the light that he had. He went to a Bible school where he was taught law. That man maybe left a very successful business. He, he, he left maybe a very successful job to passionately go and preach what he felt was the truth, yet he was just deceived. And we make the man the enemy. The man is not the enemy. One time, you know, I was... Uh, maybe five years in grace, and I was go going to my mom uh, for a weekend, my mom and dad, and I was complaining about how bad the Lord Church is and how we, I got abused in the Lord Church, and, 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 and. You know what my mom said to me? She says, why are you angry with the pastor? Don't you have a Bible, and can't you pray yourself? Mm. I didn't want that. I wanted her to tell me as well, you know, how bad the pastor is. I wanted her to confirm my word. And sometimes, you know, we are like Israel. We get led out of the desert, out of uh, 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 Egypt, and we are in the desert. And when we are in the desert, we like to sit around the campfire and tell the war stories, you know, of how God defeated Egypt of how God got me out of the law. And a whole conversation is all the time about how bad the law is, and we cannot believe that a person believes the law. What about the question, God, why did you take me out of that, and what is your vision with my life? I want the promised land. What did you have in mind for me when you took me out of that law? When I got out of that law, out of that bondage, into the message of grace, what have you got in store for me? What quality of life do you have for me? Anger to the Lord does not produce the life of God. It's even written in the Bible, the wrath of a man does not produce the righteousness of God. So grace is not, a, a grace church is not a group of people being angry at the law altogether. <laughs> a grace church is a church that has come to the realization that the quality of God's life belongs to them, that they are not slaves, but they have been set free from the flesh so that the fullness of God's love can manifest in them effortlessly. That's grace. We're under the influence of of God. Grace Church is where our hearts has been so influenced by the dynamics of God's love that we are available for the manifestation of Him in us. That's it. So we don't want to continue to live and give the law some place in our life. You know, when God told Saul to go and kill the Amalekites, this is what happened. Amalek came and 
in the desert made war with Israel as God was leading them to the promised land. And he was uh, uh, um, preventing them from entering into the true freedom God has for them. And sometimes that is a, that is a type and a shadow of legalism. We get set free from the desert and then as we are on our way in realizing the fullness of grace, we get almost kidnapped by legalism and law, which we can say is maybe a, like a law church, okay? And that stops us and keeps us in bondage and we are in a battle and in a war and we struggle to enter into and receive what God's original plan was for us. And then the Bible comes and he says, uh, uh, um, he, God speaks to Samuel and tells him, tell Saul to go and kill all the Amalekites. I want to completely remove that which was a barrier to my people. Okay? I want them, I want my people never to have any mind of Amalek. I want them not to have any mind, any thought even of such a nation that was hindering them from entering into the promised land. And then Saul went and he killed all of them. Yet he brought some animals. And then Samuel came and said to Saul, Have you done what God, the Lord has said? And he says, Yes, I've done as the Lord has said. Then he says, what, is, what am I hearing? I'm hearing sheep and I'm hearing oxen. What is this? He says, No, we've kept the best for sacrificing to God. Then he said the following words. He says, Rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Now, that word rebellion in the Hebrew is not to rebel against something, but it's the word bitterness. So what happened was Saul was bitter towards Amalek and the Amalekites for what they have done years ago in preventing the people to go into the promised land, you know, by warring against them. And that would be a good type and a shadow of us today. We received Jesus, and then we were meant for grace. We were meant for the wonderful gospel of God's freedom. And then on the way, we got like kidnapped. We got hindered by the law. And now what God says is, let that be completely destroyed. Don't come and carry some, and through some bitterness, Bring over some of the past experiences into your life now. It is as the sin of witchcraft. That witchcraft there talks about, uh, can be picked up in Galatians 3, where the Bible says, who has bewitched you that you're going back to the law? So what he's saying is, as we walk in bitterness towards the old law church, it bewitches us to become legalistic again and law-minded again, and then the law finds its life in us, and we will die as a grace church. So let us not be bitter towards those that preach to us, if you don't tithe, if you don't sow and reap, you know, God will never bless you. Let's just say they were wrong. You know, it was not them. They were deceived as well. They were also blind. They didn't see the way they were supposed to see. But that's not going to influence my life today. For I'm not under the influence of their abuse, but I'm under the influence of the love of God. We want to be free church. Hallelujah. We want to be a church that can impact our community. We want to be a church that has got so much life that people can't but be drawn to us. The vision is not for us to build a big church. The vision for us is to have His life. And I tell you where that life is, it draws people, it can draw people by the thousands. Amen. We're not trying to build a church, we're just wanting to build people. Hallelujah. And we don't want any hindrance. We don't want the, the witchcraft of bitterness to bewitch us to the point where we are having an underlying legalistic thought towards the, the local church or people. Bitter people doesn't make others happy. So if you have bitterness today towards the old system, I'm not here to judge you and tell you you are bad. I want to help you to be free. How do you forgive somebody that has abused you? This is what the Apostle Paul said, and now we're getting into what condemnation is. This is what the Apostle Paul said. 
When Paul the apostle sinned, he never said that he sinned. He said, it is not I who sin, but it is the sin in me that brings forth and lives in me. So I am actually a victim. And then he goes and he says, it is legalism and law that causes me to do what I don't want to do. The good that I want to do when I'm under the law, that I can't do. And the bad that I don't want to do, that I do, given I'm under the law. That's what Paul says. So, when you see a person living a sinful life, when you see a person, you know, abusing, manipulating, controlling for money, wanting to put himself much higher than the rest of the congregation, wanting to make the congregation his servant and abusing people, you can never say it is him. It is not him. It is the sin in him that does that. And the word forgive means to separate or to end the contract. The moment you can separate a man from his sin, that day you have truly forgiven him. When you can say, this man that has abused uh, me through ministry, this person that has preached a message to me that caused harm to me and my family, he was as much a victim of darkness as what I was, and I feel compassion on him, and I love him. It doesn't mean I need to sit under his ministry. It just means I'm not angry with him, and I'm not walking in bitterness. The Bible says, let us forgive one another, for we are not ignorant of the devices of the devil. Let me explain to you how forgiveness works. One day, there was a man, uh, you know, I was still farming, you know, I was farming, I, I farmed cabbage and watermelons. So, here was a, 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 a guy in my church, and he wanted to borrow my truck. So, I had a, a big truck. So I said, okay, you can use the truck. He wanted to move from one house to the other one. I'm the pastor. You know, please use the truck, you know. I've got no problem. So he used the truck. And then, you know, with me, I've got this law in me. If you borrow something, what must you do then? You must bring it back. Isn't that very simple? <laughs> you borrow the truck. I charge you no money. You just bring the truck back. You don't even have to wash the truck. You don't even have to put diesel in the truck. Just bring it back. So now, you know, I'm like staunch Afrikaans culture. I'm not going to phone him for the truck. He must bring my truck. So he doesn't bring the truck. One day, two days, three days, four days. But I'm, a, I'm running a farm. I need the truck. So I'm suffering. And the truck is not coming. So I phone him. He says, where's my truck? He says, no, no, my truck is in front of my house here. I said, but now what about bringing the truck back? But now remember, he's a member in the church. I'm the pastor. So I'm speaking softly, you know. <laughs> you know. So I, I want to use mercy, you know. I said, so brother, can you maybe just bring the truck? I really need the truck today. Oh, uh, the wheel broke. Okay, I mean, I use a truck most of the time. He just moved. He just did maybe 10 kilometers with it. It can't be him breaking the wheel, so it's not a problem. So I go there. Now it's on a weekend, and now I must change the wheel, put another wheel on. Now those wheels are big, and they're very heavy, and as you can see, I'm a bodybuilder. You know, <clears throat> so it's difficult for me to change that heavy wheel. And what he does is he sits on his porch and he drinks tea, looking at me, changing the wheel, not helping me. <clears throat> so this brother is now breaking some laws, you know. <clears throat> I changed the wheel and everything. Bye-bye. I got in my truck. I think in my mind, this guy is just, you know, he needs the grace of God. <laughs> so then about a month later, he phones me, Bertie, could I please use your chainsaw? <laughs> yes, brother, you can use my chainsaw, no problem. So he used my chainsaw, 
And then I wait for my chainsaw. And I wait for my chainsaw. And I wait for my chainsaw. And he doesn't come back. And then one day I phoned him about a month later. Brother, my chainsaw. Could I have my chainsaw, please? And in the meantime, you know, my wife, you know, the wife in the house, that's the one you always talk to. I said, you know this guy. You know, he's in our church. He's just lazy. That's all he is. He's lazy, man. One, what, my, what one does is if you borrow something, you give it back. If you borrow it, you give it back. And I'm not forgiving him for what he does. I'm keeping it against him, and I'm becoming more angry, you see. So now after one month, you are very angry. <laughs> so now I phone him, and I try to be calm, you know. I'm not using grace. I'm using willpower <laughs> to be calm. And he's a big guy, you know. But when you get angry, you don't care how big a man is. So I phoned him. I said, my brother, the chainsaw, uh, I, I need my chainsaw. He says, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The chainsaw is at his house. I can go and fetch it there. My culture is if you borrowed it, you bring it back to my house. So I went there. Oh, no, so, I, 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 so I, I got very upset. This is what happened. I got very upset. And I started, the willpower was not strong enough to bear the fruit of the Spirit. So, <clears throat> so I shouted at this church member. I said, you are lazy. You are crazy. There's something wrong with you. You are a pastor abuser. That's who you are. I got very upset with this guy, you know. Mm. I said, you need to repent, man. One doesn't do that. Then he brought, then his wife, he was too scared to come to my house. His wife brought the chainsaw and he burnt out the clutch of the chainsaw. And he gave it back dirty. I was so angry. I went to my wife. I said, you know what? If you borrow something, you give it back. And then as I was in my anger, I walked past the bookshelf. And I saw a book I borrowed a year ago and that I never gave back. I was really condemned. <laughs> you see, <laughs> we don't want to live by the law. If I rather said, you know, this brother, maybe he struggles to give things back. Maybe he wants to give it back, but he just doesn't know. Let me just go and fetch the thing the first day, you know, and just forget it. It would have been much easier for me. But I was tormented for about two or three months. And the torment that came was from my own legalistic way, thinking, um, you know, he must do this, he must do that. Instead, I should have said, you know, maybe this person didn't, ha didn't have the right upbringing. Maybe he is just feeling weak in himself because the thing broke, and now he feels condemned, and the condemnation in him is actually causing this to happen. So let me just go and fetch it. That's what I should have said, but I was so legalistic. In the very same way with church, people, we cannot live. Uh, with the legalism and the hurt from the law in the grace church. Get rid of it, man. Let's just get rid of it. Just say, the law pastor, just forgive him. This is how you forgive him. He didn't know what he was doing. He was as much under the law. What hurt me wasn't that man. It was that message. And I believed that message. I could also have read the Bible. I could also have prayed. Thank you, Lord, that I'm set free. I could have had that, but you, you, I could have known it earlier, but you, in your mercy, came and loved me, and now I love that man. And forget the abuse. Because that abuse will harm you, and it will harm what God wants to do in the world today through grace. What is condemnation? Romans 7 verse 1. Let us read that. I mean, I just got the permission to use half of the lunchtime for my message. You know? 
So let us just go to Romans 7 and, and talk about condemnation. It says, Know you not, brethren, for I speak to them, this is verse 1, that know the law, how that the law has dominion over a man as long as what he lives. For the woman which has a husband is bound to the law, bound by the law to her husband as long as what he lives. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. So then, if while her husband lives, she be married to another, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from the law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another. Wherefore, my brethren, you also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that you should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. Now, let me explain that. What Paul comes is, is he likens, he likens uh, what Adam has done in bringing the law, which is finding, it's the law of death, which is I will find my life by what I do. He calls that a husband. And then he calls us the wife of that husband. And then he says, as long as what the husband is alive, then you will bear, and you are married to that husband, you will bear the fruit of that husband. Then he comes and he says, Jesus basically incarnated that husband and then died. When Jesus died away the law husband, the contract with the law was ended, and now we will not bear the fruit of the law in us anymore. The fruit of the law or the children of the law in our life is sin. It's called sin. And that sin destroys your life and it leads to death. So, when you are under the law, when you are under legalism, you are condemned to a life of sin and death. That's what the word condemn means, and we're going to see it now. Condemn does not mean guilt, to feel guilty. To feel guilty is an emotion in your heart where you feel guilt, where you feel obligation. The, 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 the New Testament defines condemnation as a legal term or basically as a sentence. The correct translation for the word condemn there would be sentence. It would be like, um, the best way to, to, to say it is like a, a, in a, is if somebody is caught for stealing and he comes to the court, he will be judged. Okay? Judge would mean, bring me the information about what this guy's done. And then I will make a judgment. The word judgment means to make a decision. I will make a judgment and a declaration over him. So I judge this person as guilty. So now he's judged. But he's not condemned. Condemn would be you go to jail for three months. I condemn you to jail for three months. That is condemnation. So when we, when we as, as grace believers, live... We are expecting, or, or let me put it this way, under the law, we are condemned to sin. We are condemned to bitterness. We are condemned to hatred. We are condemned to being judgmental. We are condemned to all kinds of sin. That is what you are condemned unto by the law. In the beginning, God had a plan. His plan was for man to be co-seated in the Trinity. And from that Trinitarian life, you will find His quality of life, which is contained in love and joy and peace in your life. And you would feel what it feels like to be Him. You would feel what it feels like to love someone. You would feel what it feels like to be generous. You would feel what it feels like to be happy. You would feel what it feels like to want to give your life to someone or something. That is what God intended for us. And then, by the law, Adam thought, I can have that life. And then as he tried to have the life possessed by God, by the law, he was condemned to death. The end of the law is death. It's not life, it's death. So, the law, trying to have life by the law, you will be condemned to a life of sin. Now you might say, but you know, 
I might have some sin in my life. What now? Your sins are forgiven you. God is not keeping your sins against you. The Bible says that God reconciled the world unto himself by not imputing their trespasses against them. What that means is God, when you sinned, he didn't say this is you. He said he didn't, uh, did not uh, uh, impute it to you. He imputed it to the flesh and the law working sin in you. Or the flesh manifesting sin because it tries to have life by its own power. So it's not imputed against us. So if you do have a sin in your life, you're not going to go to hell for that. But if I have a bitterness in my life, if I have got a hatred in my life, or if I have some kind of addiction in my life, all that I do, I go to God and I say to the Lord, Lord, I can still see that there must be an area in my life where I think, where where I'm law-minded. Because This thing that I don't want to do, I'm doing it. So it is not by my own will that I do these things. It must be something in me forcing me that's taken me captive in this area of my life. So Lord, Lord, please reveal your love of God to me in such a way, and I'm available for your love of God, for your love of God, that I can experience your influence of love in my life, even in this area, that I can be bear your fruit. Amen. I hope you understand what I'm saying there. Let us read on. So what, or what Paul says here is he says that Jesus died the law man away, for the law was bearing fruit of death in us. So the death in your life is on account of a legalistic belief. You know, I, I remember the first, and, and I've seen in the, in the world, that there are people, and I would say in my own life there was also areas like that where you would think, now that I am under grace, you know, that means God's not angry with me when I do something wrong. Listen, he was never angry. What the problem was is he wanted to end the death in your life. The law could not give you God's quality of life. The law could not produce peace. But grace can. Amen. So that's what God wants to give you. And Paul says here that Jesus ended the law man. Now let's read from verse um, 8. It says, Paul says, But sin, taking occasion, uh, in the Greek it also means having its opportunity by the commandment or the law, wrought in me, all manner of concupiscence. That word concupiscence there is, the word, is a word for uh, uh, extraordinary desire. For without the law, sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. This is the Apostle Paul. Let me explain this. Now, please don't be shocked at what I'm going to say. Just hear me. You know, we have made Paul this big saint you know, as if he could never do something wrong. But let's look at what Paul says here. Paul, in the context of Romans 7, and I'm not going to go through the whole of Romans 7 explaining this, is talking about the 10th commandment, which says you shall not desire. Okay? He says, Paul says, I was alive without the law once. But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. So what does that mean? What does that mean? That means Paul was alive without the law. When was that? That was not in the seven days before his circumcision. You know, when he was born. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about the time from the road where he, on the way to Damascus, where he met with the Lord, where he got into the gospel of grace, until he became legalistic again. That's what he's talking about. He said, I was alive without the law. He calls himself alive. Why? Because he was feeling the life of the Trinity manifesting in him when he realized how he is united with the Father, how he's one with Jesus, how the holiness of God belongs to him, how the righteousness of God belongs to him. But then the Bible says, when the commandment came, sin revived. In other words, he was living without the law. But then when the commandment came, 
In other words, it can come in two ways. When he tried to obey the tenth commandment, again, saying, well, I'm going to live, I'm going to have life by not coveting after other people's things. Or when he was saying, look how good I am now under grace, for I don't covet after anything. And he found his identity again in his fruit and not in the root. Okay. When he became legalistic again, what happened? He said, sin revived. That's the only word in the Bible where we get the word revival. Really. That's the re Paul had a sin revival. The revival that took place in him was based on him becoming legalistic and law-minded again. And he said, the I found sin coming to me. And then we can read on. Let me just find the right verse. It says, if then I do that which I don't want to do, verse 16, I consent unto the law that it's good. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwells no good thing. For to, be, for to will is present with me, but how to perform that which I want is not there. For the good that I want to do, uh, sorry, for the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Now, if I do that which I don't want to do, it is no more I that do it, but the sin that indwells me. And then he goes to Romans 8 verse 1. Then he says, therefore, there is now no more condemnation for them that are in Christ who walk not after the flesh or the law, but after the spirit or the gospel of grace. Now, what is that condemnation? He was just explaining that condemnation. He said he was condemned to a life where he would do things he don't want to do. That is the condemnation of the law. That's the judgment of the law. Under the law and legalism, you will never have victory. You will never have peace. You will never have joy. You'll never know what it is to really love somebody. You will always be self-centered. It will always be about you. You will never know what it feels like to feel like God. You'll never know what true compassion is under the law. It will just be the flesh and you, and you will be condemned to a life where in the inward parts you want to do good, you want to love, you want to be generous, you want to care, you want to embrace somebody, you want to be good to somebody, you, where you say, I don't want to gossip, I want to speak good, but you will be condemned to do what you hate. That's what Paul was saying. That's the context there. And he speaks about this in the context of a person that has already believed in grace and then became legalistic. So can you see how important it is? Now listen, people. We shouldn't be law haters. Rather be a God lover. Amen. Righteousness by the law will end your life. So, like the Apostle Paul Count all those things but done. Okay, for by it you can have none of the quality of God's life. For the reason, the way this body was made, the way I've been designed, the way you've been designed was for good works. You are made to receive love. You are made to receive kindness. You are made to have a heart which is flooded with goodness. You are made to have a mouth your mouth and your thoughts are designed to want to be good to others. And what the law does is it takes a vessel that has been made and designed for that which is good and abuses it to the point that it still has the will to do good, but the frustration of never getting it right. That is death, man. That is death. Glory to God. Glory to God that the law could not bring life. For if the law could bring life, we would never have known what it is to be intimate with our Abba. Hallelujah. Who of you was in church last Sunday morning? Can you just raise your hands, please? Okay. So there's a lot of you that hasn't been. Let me just tell you this story quickly, explaining the quality of God's life. In South Africa, there's a town called Cullinan. 
It's just north of um, Pretoria. It's a very rich, uh, a diamond-rich area. And in that area, this is the way it works. It works like that in mining in South Africa. Should you pick up a diamond? I don't know, under the new South Africa, old South Africa, this is how it worked. Should you pick up a diamond? You know, um, that diamond, if you pick it up in your backyard, you were digging there or you were planting a tree or whatever, and you find this diamond there, that diamond does not belong to you. It belongs to the mine that's got the mining rights for diamonds in that area. In this case, it is a company called De Beers. I'm sure you know that company. Very big company. So one day this lady, she didn't have a lot of money. You know, um, she was in her garden, digging in her garden. And here she found this massive diamond. It's a true story. Massive diamond. And she was so happy because she could take it, this diamond to De Beers and then the beers will give her the market value for that diamond. So she was so happy. All her financial stress was finished. Her children would be happy. Everybody's happy. I mean, this is like winning the lottery. Here she, she, she's, she's getting ready to go to, the, um, to give the diamond to the beers. There's a knock at the door. It is a beggar. The beggar says, ma'am, don't you have me a dollar? and some bread. She looked at the beggar, and over, she was overwhelmed with compassion for the beggar. She felt such a love for the beggar. She went into a bedroom, got the diamond, and gave the beggar the diamond. Now, we would all say that's crazy. He will not know how to spend the money. He's going to abuse it. He's going to drink it out. We will all have all our reasons. A few years later, there was a knock at the door again, and behold, the same beggar in the same condition. He says, ma'am, I don't want money and I don't want food. And he reached into his pocket, took the diamond, and says, here is your diamond. I don't want your money. I want that which caused you to give this diamond to me. And that which caused her to give the diamond to, her, to him is what I'm talking about, the quality of God's life. That's what is given to us in our union with the Trinity. And no law can give it to us. What the law would say is the following. Give away diamonds and you'll have the quality of life that was in the heart of the woman. No amount of giving away of diamonds can produce what was in the heart of that woman when she gave that diamond. The law is a deception that says, by giving away diamonds, I can have a compassionate heart. The law can never produce compassion. The law can never produce life. It can never produce kindness. It can never produce mercy in your heart. It is a gift from God. Amen. So, I want to tell you, church, there is no more condemnation for those who don't walk after, who walks after the Spirit and don't walk after the flesh. So we are not condemned to a life of sin and bitterness and hatred anymore. Let us enjoy the life that God has given for us and not settle for any bitterness in our lives. For bitterness is like the witchcraft of the law that will cause us just to have pain and more hurt and more sorrow. You are deeply loved, church. You are cared for. I know this message might challenge you. You might even feel a bit guilty. You know, it's normal for the human heart to want to feel guilty when he's corrected. When my wife comes to me and like I said, you know, I felt a bit depressed. She said to me, get over yourself, you know. There's other people also living in this house. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's just, you, you know, then you, you, you feel, oh, you feel bad, you know, you know I've, I've actually made it a bit bad for her and for the kids and I don't want to do that and you feel a bit bad. Listen, just get over that as well. He's not keeping it against you. It is the fruit of legalism. So we don't walk in bitterness. We, we, we walk in the Spirit and what we expect is the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. We are, I, you know, we've heard this. If you're under grace, you'll be more generous than when you are under the law. So if you're under the law, give 10%. Now you must give 30%. It's a lie. It is a lie. We cannot preach it that way. 
This is how we preach it. Under grace, you will just have the generosity of God. That's it. And give your life as, and make it available for that. I make my life available for generosity. I make my life available for helping people. I make my life available for the fruit of God. Can we pray together? Hallelujah. Father, I want to thank you for your unconditional love. I want to thank you for your mercy and your grace. I want to thank you, Lord, that we qualify. We qualify by Jesus Christ. I thank you, Lord, that Jesus was worthy to pay for us, for there was no one else that was worthy. No angel, no holy being, nothing. And thank you, Lord, that holiness is not the end goal, but the point where we start. Thank you, Lord, that righteousness is not the end goal, but the point of departure. And thank you, Lord, that the end goal is immortality and the highest quality of life that we could ever imagine by you. Thank you, Father, that you've given. You were not stingy, but you were willing to share with us your quality of life, that we can know what it is to lose our breath over someone else, that we can know what it is to be content with someone else, that we can look at somebody and separate him from the law that causes the sin in his life. Thank you, Father, that we don't have to walk by guilt or condemnation that because in you we are set free from the system where I want to do good but I can't and to the system where the good lives in me. Thank you for that, Father. I just declare this church blessed. I just declare this church well spoken of. I declare this church as a light to the world. I declare this church as a church that will reach the nations with love and mercy and grace. I declare Pastor Peter and the people in this church as people that are loving and caring and kind and generous as an example for thousands of people who are getting into the message of grace. I thank you, Lord, that this church will be a, play a significant role in helping thousands of churches transition successfully from law, law to grace by love and mercy. Thank you for that, my Father. I declare the people in this church healed and blessed. I declare them well spoken of. I speak over you a mind that can see how high, how wide, how deep, and how long the unconditional love of God is. I declare over you a tenacity to make use of the length, the breadth, the depth, and the unending love of God, that you will use it in your life in a very bold way. I thank you, Father, for this church. In the spirit, I embrace them. I impart my life to them. I thank you, Father, for bringing me here. You are an awesome Abba. Amen. Amen. Thank you.